Good evening. Welcome to the League of Women Voters presentation of a candidate date debate for the mayoral candidates. We do so many, I hard to keep them straight. So tonight we're going to hear from the candidates for Simi Valley Mayor. And we have with us all of the candidates except for Wayne. He has not yet joined. Keith Mashburn is with us, but audio only. Uh, the forum will go along. We'll have opening statements. Then we'll take your questions, submit it on the website, and then we'll have closing statements. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of the League of Women Voters, Betsy Patterson. Good evening. I'm Betsy Patterson, the current president of the League of Women Voters of Ventura County. 100 years ago, the 19th Amendment was ratified, giving women across the nation the right to vote. We hold the, vote, the right to vote precious because not all people were given that right in the original Constitution. And for 100 years, the League of Women Voters has been dedicated to encouraging civic engagement and informing voters about the candidates and the issues. From its beginnings and continuing today, the League is a nonpartisan political organization. We do not support or oppose any candidate or political party. Each of us has a voice in our government if we use our vote. To be informed voters, we must ask questions of the candidates and understand the pros and cons of each ballot proposition before we cast our vote. Thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you have many of your questions answered by the candidates. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. We'll now begin with our opening statements. We randomly drew straws earlier as far as the order. And our first speaker is Brandon Fortuna for one and a half minutes. You can see the timer, right, Brandon? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. When you're ready, please. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Brandon, and I'm running for Simi Valley Mayor. I'm a terrible public speaker, so you have to apologize. I have to apologize for that. Um, I've been I've lived in town most of my life, and I've always thought Simi is a pretty awesome place. But I've always thought that we could do better. We could always do better for our marginalized communities, for our lower class, our our poorer people, our homeless people, and just all of us who are don't have much of a voice. So one of the biggest reasons why I'm running is essentially to empower people to get involved in local politics. You know, regardless of who you vote for, we need to all be the change that we want to see. Vote for people who you think represent you, but also get involved, get involved with direct action. I would love to see all of our constituents get involved in things they, they deem necessary and just get involved to help everybody. And I will see the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Our next candidate is Robert Clarizio. Hello, everybody. I just like to say God bless everybody. And God bless our League of Women Voters for putting this on. And I appreciate everything that goes into this. Um, these uh, meetings and with COVID, it's a lot of work. And so um, they're getting this information out to you. My name is Robert Clarizio. I've lived in Simi Valley for 53 years. Um, you know, I'm born and raised. I've seen this town. I've made mistakes in this town. I've thrived in this town. And then I've been down in this town. I have have kind of been in training, I'd like to say, for this position of mayor. And, and as this was put on my heart to do, and as I'm getting orientated with the the way the city fundamentals work, I realize I've definitely been in training for this. It, it takes someone who can empathize, have empathy in all the different levels and of diverse levels that the city has. Okay, so I'm here and I would like to argue that I'm one of the most diverse people that you guys could vote for. And I'm looking for change. I, I love our city. I'm so proud of our city. I went to Yuma, Arizona for school. And when I, I could talk nothing about Simi Valley, Yuma. Thank, thank you, Robert. Have, have to okay, stop thank you. Right. Our next candidate <laughs> is Joe Ayala. I should unmute myself, huh? Hi, everyone. My name is Joe Ayala. I'm uh, running for mayor, Simi Valley. I'm a husband, a father, and a union leader. Uh, my family and I moved to Simi Valley a little over 10 years ago. I'm originally from uh, Texas, Laredo, Texas, actually. 
Um, I'm the vice president of NABIT Local 53. We're a broadcast union uh, that represents most of the broadcast technicians in Los Angeles. I'm a television director by trade, something I've done for the last uh, 35 years. Uh, and I'm running for mayor of Simi Valley because I believe that our city leaders uh, lack vision for our city. I think that we can do better. Um, one of the things that obviously my, uh, my experience would, provide, would uh, bring me would be to look at jobs in Simi Valley. I want to promote our local businesses. I want to keep and create more middle class jobs in Simi Valley. We need to look at our affordable housing crisis and take control of it before the state does. And lastly, I'd like to bring in what I believe are much needed community service programs. My father was very successful uh, back in Texas at uh, writing grants to the city, the county and the state and funding these programs in the city with very little impact economically to the city. I think it would benefit our community and uh, to Brandon's point, and I think even Robert brought this up, this would be something that our city could use. Uh, my name is Joe Ayala, I'm running for mayor. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I see the rest of my time. Thank you. Our next candidate is Robbie Hidalgo. And we'll give you a moment, Robbie, to unmute. There we go. I didn't know if you had it or I did. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. And especially I'd like to echo what uh, Robert was reaching at in terms of thanking the League of Women Voters for pulling this together at such short notice. I know this is a challenge in the middle of a pandemic. It's important for the community. I know it's important for all of us as candidates to have the opportunity. So great thanks to the League of Women Voters. By the way, you don't have to be a woman to join. Um, that being said, my name is Robbie Hidalgo. I too am running for mayor. I am a 33-year resident of Simi Valley. I have four beautiful children that have grown up in this uh, community. As a matter of fact, two of them finished finals today, and they're kind of waiting for me to finish up and get them ice cream for their celebration. Uh, locally, I've worked as a uh, nonprofit director, as Joe was uh, referring to as some community service uh, programs. I've actually initiated a slew of community service programs. One of the things I'm the most proud about is heavy impact community service, absolutely no impact to the local taxpayer budget. And I believe that that type of innovative approach by looking for public-private partnerships and new and innovative ways of addressing community needs, not only impact the community as a whole, but also provide for economic development, creating a new value proposition for the city of Simi Valley. Um, there's a lot behind that that touches on housing, that touches on economic development. I know those questions are likely to be forthcoming later. So I'll defer to that time and let's see the rest of my balance of my time to you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Keith Mashburn. Thank you, David. Uh, Keith Mashburn, 65 year resident, which means I wasn't quite born here, but darn near. And uh, raised here in Simi Valley, went to Simi Valley schools, uh, became a uh, Ventura County firefighter, uh, put in 30 years of service uh, here in the county, mainly in Simi Valley. And when I left, uh, I caught the entrepreneurial spirit and my wife and I had like three brick and mortar retail businesses in town. And that's what got me interested in uh, politics, local politics. I went to work for Judy Michaels as an aide. I became a planning commissioner, a council member, and uh, currently I'm serving as the mayor and I'm very proud to have achieved that level. And uh, I, I look for economic development as one of the biggest issues facing our city. It's the biggest issue facing any city. You have to bring uh, business in, you have to bring jobs in, and you have to bring manufacturing in. And uh, I believe that people look at our city and they say, okay, how's the crime rate? How's the education system? And how is the city run? We have to look at all these things to determine what it, we're providing for this city and economic development is one of the biggest issues facing the city and one of the most difficult to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the league. Thank you. Uh, we have one more candidate who is running but was unable to join us tonight and that's Wayne Hampton Holland III. Our first question, we're gonna start with you, Joe. Let's talk about uh, the police department. We are spending about 48% of the city budget on law enforcement. As mayor, would you seek to change this? What are your views about defending the police? Thanks, thank you for the question. Um, actually, my father was a policeman for many years back home in, um, in Laredo. And so uh, the, the police are actually near and dear to my heart in many ways. I, um, 
I'm not a defund the police type of person. I do think that we can use our resources with the police and there is something that we, we should be trying to do. I think my dad even talked about this uh, a week ago with me actually. And uh, we should really be using some of that money instead of just for the enforcement portion of, of, the, of the police department and looking at crime prevention and also community outreach. Police are, the police in the city do a good job at policing the city, but I think they could also do a good job at reaching out to the, to the community. Um, there, there shouldn't be an us and them attitude between citizens and police. It should be, you know, when I was a young man, it was the beat cop walking down my street and saying hello to everybody and everybody knew who he was and he was friends of mine. I mean, it was a guy, he said, hey Joe, how's it going? What are you, what are you doing today? Get out of the street, things like that. So I think we can bring that stuff back to the city. I think that's important. And it's a good way of using our resources, uh, our, police dollar, uh, our police dollars in the most effective way uh, in regards to um, helping this, the community. Thank you. Brandon, we'll go to you for the same question. About 48% of the city budget goes to law enforcement. As mayor, would you seek to change this? What are your views on defunding the police? Personally, I believe that about 48% is a had too high. Uh, looking at statistics from 2018, it seems Thousand Oaks is doing about 8 to 10 percent less than their police budget with about the same or slightly lower crime rates. I believe that we can allocate some of those funds to fund more social programs. They're, like Joe was saying, a little more preventative and supposed to, as opposed to more punitive. And I would see the rest of my time. Keith? Uh, same question to you as far as the amount of the budget that goes to law enforcement. Would you seek to change that if you're elected? And what is your position on defunding the police? I absolutely am against any defunding of the police. And I think that uh, it, we have to take a look at the total revenues brought in by the city when you uh, look at the total cost of our police department. And so uh, not bringing in as many as other cities uh, as much our uh, percentage of the cost of the police department is going to appear higher, but in reality, it's not. Um, I think we need to take a close look at what's happening with our police department. It's going very strongly towards uh, items such as there's a defective, his specialty is mental health. He's currently on the job, working on the job. Most officers do a heck of a lot more social work than they actually do crime work and it, they're just the first line of defense. And so we, we could uh, look at training, use the current budget, and maybe uh, we could be able to train more officers in the area of uh, mental health issues and de-escalation and programs like that. But uh, we certainly don't wanna take a city that has such a perfect, not perfect, I used the wrong word there, but nearly perfect record of crime control and safety in this community and to defund them would just be the wrong direction in my opinion. Thank you. We'll go to our next candidate, Robert Clarizio. What is your position about the amount of the budget that goes to the police department and defunding the police? Well, um, as Robbie and uh, Brandon, who uh, attended a, a fabulous orientation, it was about four hours long. Um, we got uh, the chief of police. He explained a lot of stuff about the budget. He explained the breakdown. He explained stuff, stuff that the average person doesn't really know. And um, it was fascinating. Looking at the breakdown of the budget, it's right in line with everybody else. There was some red flags in there, obviously, um, this isn't probably the time to talk about that, uh, those areas where salaries seemed inflated, but the salaries don't just go to the police officers. They go to other things, other programs. I think Keith just touched on it. Uh, training's a big issue. I lived here my whole life and the police department has come a long way. There wasn't even a police department here when I got here. And um, I think we have a fabulous police department. I think training, with everything going on right now. And yes, some things need to be discussed with, within the, the department and uh, you know, as far as that budget added up. 
you know, how it added up across salaries and stuff. But, um, you know, I'm against it, defunding them totally, I think, in training and uh, okay. public you, awareness. Right, thank you. Thank you. Robbie, same question to you about the amount of the budget that goes towards the police and your views on defunding the police. Thank you, David, for the question. First of all, I want to say public safety is an absolute hallmark of the city of Simi Valley. Anybody who's been here for any duration recognizes that. We're one of the safest communities in the United States, and that is a position that we all hope to foster and continue. That being said, defunding the police may go down in history as probably the worst marketing phrase ever conjured up. Uh, in order to sustain public safety, we need to consider supplementation of public safety. Uh, I don't want to speak out of turn. I know that Chief Livingstone will be sure to be on my cell phone, direct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've discussed on the order of roughly 80% of the calls that are coming in, of 16,000 calls that come in per year to the police, end up requiring some type of a social response. So our police force is indeed CIT trained and certified, but that is a I believe it's a 10 hour, sort of a one day course, which gives you a primer, as Keith had mentioned, in de-escalation techniques, being able to identify mental health issues from criminal issues. I don't think there's anything wrong with us starting to look at 21st century policing tactics, which include, uh, Joe and I must be the same age because I remember my local beat cop, he knew my mother, that was a heck of a lot worse than, than anything else. So if I got in trouble, we dealt with it on a community basis. And I think that really speaks to the nature of the type of community that we all hope to foster here in Simi Valley. So absolutely against defunding the police. I am for supplementing it with concepts like CAHOOTS, which is a model program in Oregon. And that's my position. Thank you, Robbie. Keith, we're gonna to move to you with the next question. Okay. The question is, as far as housing here in Simi Valley, uh, where do you stand on future developments? What would you do to help bring in more affordable housing? And workforce housing, just in general, what would be your policies to produce more housing? Well, that's, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, Simi Valley is, is, for the most part, built out, meaning that we have to be very creative on where we uh, put high density and any new housing at all, for that matter. But we are uh, being very proactive in the area of looking for opportunities for affordable housing and of course workforce housing. And there does definitely seem to be a trend for people to want to go smaller size. And I don't have a problem with the uh, ideas of uh, having the higher density construction in areas of where there's transportation like rail service and such a, uh, like that. But we also have to remember that we have to have a balance in the city. There has to be areas also for business owners that maybe are very successful. They need properties that uh, are bigger and that they want to uh, uh, have nice homes and gated communities. So we have to have a, a balance, but definitely our focus right now is affordable housing and workforce housing. And we're making uh, very good strides in that area. If you can just look by the uh, uh, numbers that we're, we're creating the arena numbers that we're producing are in line with what the state is asking us to do. Okay, thank you. And Robbie, we'll go to you next. Same question. What are your plans for promoting housing? I think there are a couple of different issues and challenges that we have with housing. Keith spoke to some of those, which is that we're essentially a build out. We don't have a lot of room. We have a hillside ordinance, which prevents us from creating Beverly Hills up in the mountains. So we're really going to have to work with what we have, which requires some reevaluation of the general plan because this leads over into economic development as well. We have very low inventory of industrial space, for example, and if we want to drive those types of business into the community, we need to take a look at what the next 10 to 20 years is gonna look like for our community in terms of growth and the availability for housing. That being said, uh, I agree that typically among the community, the vast majority of people appreciate the footprint that we have or somewhat leery of gentrification of the community with too many high rise or high density uh, housing options. So I'm a huge advocate for the incentivization of the development of ADUs, uh, in particular JADUs and detached ADUs, anything we can do from the planning department to help create or maximize our housing footprint, uh, or maximize our housing without maximizing our housing footprint, as well as land trusts. Land trusts are an area which gives us a little more control of the affordability of housing. Inclusionary zoning typically doesn't provide enough 
affordable housing, and as Keith will attest, many projects simply buy themselves out of providing an affordable component. So I think between land trusts and the expansion of ADUs, we'll be moving in the right direction in terms of maximizing our housing capacity here in Sydney. Thank you, Brandon. Same question to you. What are your policies for promoting housing? Honestly, I would like to second what both Robbie and Keith said. Um, I believe we have built on a lot of the land here in Simi, and if we keep, keep uh, building on the rest of it, we're not going to have a beautiful mountains that we have anymore. However, I do believe we need to push a little bit harder for affordable housing and workforce housing. There's too many of us who are having a hard time just affording to live in this beautiful city, and we have too many unhoused brethren out there that also need the help. So we need to keep doing what we're doing, push a little bit harder for affordable housing and workforce housing. I'll see you the rest of my time. Thank you. And we'll go to Joe Ayala for the same question, Joe. What are your plans for uh, promoting housing? Well, I am uh, an advocate of affordable housing and workforce housing. Um, I mean, our housing crisis is out of control. We can't, you can't buy a home. <laughs> you can't buy a meaningful home for anything less than half a million dollars nowadays. And that's just not an, an approachable figure for most people that are starting out. I look at affordable housing not as just workforce housing or things that you know somebody else can come in and buy. I'm thinking about my kids, honestly. I'm thinking about the future of this town. They're, the housing prices are out of control in this country. They've, run, they've risen to a, to, a, to a point, especially in the state of California, they've risen to a point where it really is almost impossible for a person just starting out in society to, to, in, in their life to be able to buy a house. So there are, I think, as Robbie and I think everybody else already mentioned this, there are places that we can build in Simi Valley. I actually look at the 118 corridor as a possible venue. There, there is a lot of dead land out there and it's not beautiful hillside land. It's more like a fire hazard waiting to happen. So I would, I would think that would be a good place to build up and, and not, um, and it wouldn't impact the houses or the housing prices of the neighboring or their neighbors. So that would kind of be a win-win for everybody. We'd get the housing built and we'd also be able to keep our housing, our, our affordable, our the housing prices as they are in our neighborhoods. But as I said before, I am an advocate of affordable housing and workforce housing and I would work for that goal. We gotta take control of it before the state does. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. We'll move on to you with same question about promoting policies to increase housing. Well, this, this is, this is something that's going to be a challenge for Simi Valley, just like other cities of this nature. There is a build out plan. Uh, I saw it. Uh, we were unfortunate enough to, to get that information. And uh, yes, so there's a limit to where we can build. It, it can be amended. My position on it is we need, we need to figure it out. The community needs to decide as a whole. And as far as affordable housing goes, let's make the housing more affordable. There's creative ways to do this. Lots of people have their 30 year old son or daughter, daughter-in-law and son, you know, and son still living at home, but they'll have an $80,000 truck and a $150,000 trailer attached to it. They were financed that. So this is something that I'd like to get in discussion with people and start this right here in Simi Valley and be, be the blueprint. Instead of building projects, let's get people back to, to the American dream and those kids can start benefiting from tax write-offs and also your feeling of home ownership, pride, instead of just paying rent. So this is something I want to team on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Robbie, we're going to move to you first for the next question. Robbie, is there an issue that you feel has been mismanaged by the city? And how would you have handled it differently? That's a wonderful question. Great open-ended question. I, 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 I want to tell you, rather than dissect individual issues that I think were mismanaged, uh, because I think there are several, I don't think it's out of malice. So my implication isn't that someone is at personal fault. And I've spoken about many of these things publicly, uh, speaking of actions, for example, that the council has taken that has resulted in a fractionalization of our community, polarization of the community that have turned 
city council meetings into shouting fests and sign fests and allegations of being, be, people being bussed in. And we've gotten to the point where we're double checking with people if they live in the city, if they make a comment here. There are instances like that that I think have led up to being considered in error. But in general, what I feel is that we have polarized as a city. The California Constitution, Article 2, Section 6, calls for city governance to be nonpartisan. But I think they need a little more than not checking the Democrat or Republican box on your initial paperwork. I think what they need is that there's no Democratic or Republican way to pick up the city's trash or to work on a waterworks project. And the more and more we approach any issue or the business of the city from a left and right dynamic, the more that the community becomes factionalized. And the more factionalized we are, the less effective we are. We don't make progress. So that would be my, my response is this polarity, this duality of uh, political ideology in local government. Thank you. Keith, you're up next. Is there an issue that you feel has been mismanaged and how would you handle it differently? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, a, a lot of people don't realize that uh, the mayor or individual council members, that's one vote and you have to have three votes to do anything. I mean, the mayor is a title but it's uh, the, our form of government does not mean the mayor is the city manager and can't just dictate what's going to happen. So I think that needs to be understood. And uh, further, I look at the city as we have sewers that need to flow. We have water that needs to flow to the home. So when you turn on the spigot, you get water out of it, good, clean, safe water. You need to be able to drive down your uh, street without falling into potholes. This is what a city government does, our size. Now, I've oversimplified it, of course. However, none of those issues care if you're left or right. And it doesn't come into our council when we make these decisions. Uh, where, you know, the, the sewer flowing down to the treatment plant does not care if it was voted in or out by a left wing or right wing person. And so we are here to serve the people and that's of this community and that's it. And I think that's uh, one area that we, we need to completely focus on. And that's what I try doing with our, with our council is bring them together to realize this is not left and right. This is what's best for our community. Thank you, Robert. Same question to you. Do you feel there's been an issue that has been mismanaged by the city? And what would be your solution to that? Well, I, you know, I'd like to touch on what Keith said. Yes, I, I mean, I, I agree that this, you know, the mayor position is actually the least of them. It's the citizens, the citizens that are supposed to be in control of the city. They bring their issues to the city council, which the mayor has a vote, just like the other four members. So it's the same. The mayor is supposed to be the liaison between the people of Simi Valley and these city council members, which are more like parliament almost is the way it's set up. Um, so yes, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of things that are mismanaged. We make mistakes, we're human. Uh, one that stands out, you know, in my head is is recently, um, you know, there's citizens that want to be heard, what, whether they're right or wrong. It's our responsibility or whoever's going to be mayor to let those people speak and, and try to empathize with them. The mayor's position is not shut up. We're going to do it my way or this is my house. So I feel like, you know, this position is very important. To, to get the word out for everybody in Simi Valley. Thank you. And Joe, we'll go to you next. Do you think there's an issue that has been mismanaged? What would be your solutions? Um, well, I wouldn't be running for mayor if I thought everything was great. That's, a, that's an easy answer, actually, but I, I don't want to be dismissive. Um, there are a few things that I, that I, I mean, obviously Robbie touched, and I think Robert, and I think everybody actually has touched on these points. Uh, there is a division in our city that didn't exist. Um, you know, when I first moved here, I didn't see this. Uh, and I've seen um, a lot of change. I've been to these city council meetings. I was at that SB 54 meeting. I was at the, 
there's a rule now I've heard that uh, you have to have two votes. There was that before the city, one city council member got elected, any one city council member could raise their hand and they would get something put on the agenda. And then whenever she got elected, now you have to have two votes to get something put on the agenda. I don't know where that came from, but that didn't exist years ago. There's a lot of things that we can do. We're behind on, on submitting the, the, the minutes. I mean, if you want to get to the, to the nitty gritty on this, there's a lot of things that we, that, that we as a city, that the city has mismanaged. And um, I the think the most important one, at least in my mind, is the divisiveness that exists in our city now. Why I stepped up to run for mayor is because I want to, I want to bring a sense of unity to our city. I think everyone needs a voice and we should, we should be able to listen to everyone and I have friends of mine from every, speaking of nonpartisan, they're from every partisan side. And we all speak, we can speak, we can have a civilized conversation without getting in a fight or being dismissive. That's what I wanna do as mayor. Thank you. Brandon, same question to you. Is there an issue you feel has been mismanaged? I would like to second everything everyone else has said. Uh, I know it sounds kind of a cop out, but that's been, that's true. There's been, a lot of issues have been very polarizing. But when you ask me that question, um, one that's kind of near and dear to me, I guess, is uh, seeing me had a very bad rap sheet with drugs. I've had a lot of friends die from overdoses, get involved with drugs or whatever, and I feel like our approach has been too punitive. I believe that a push for decrim decriminalization of drugs could help get our addict friends the help they need and to be able to kick nasty habit and save some lives. So that to me is one of the biggest issues that I've seen in the past few years growing up in seeing me uh, play this town. I like to see it the rest of my time. Okay, well, we're gonna stay with you anyway, Brandon, for the next question. So um, when you're ready, this question deals with the economic vitality of Simi Valley. What do you think are the steps that the community should do or the city council in particular to help attract new businesses? And you can include in that just your thoughts about the Simi Valley Town Center. That is an incredibly difficult question. And I wish I knew the best way to answer that. I've always been a person who's always appreciated local spots. I love to show, shop local and support all the local businesses. And we need to find a way to promote all of our local businesses better. I also, I've lived here long enough to see three different Walmarts go up and five or six different Chase Banks come all over town. And I feel like we need a little more push towards local businesses as opposed to the big conglomerates that seem to pop up all over our town. I understand that we need some of those big ones to drive in some, some funds to the city, but at the same time, putting more of a push towards our local businesses could benefit us a little bit more. And I wish I had a better explanation for all of that. I'll see the rest of my time. Okay, thank you. Robert, we'll go to you next. Uh, what is your view about attracting businesses to Simi Valley and also your thoughts on the town center? Well, before I opened my own consulting firm, I worked union my whole life. I was very active in the union. And uh, one of the things that you learn if you go to the union meetings, which I would attend faithfully, is unions will do something called subsidize. They will subsidize jobs so that the union gets the contract to keep the workers working. Now the city should have the means to do some form of subsidization and we can help these people. I mean, it breaks my heart to, to see the empty storefronts everywhere. You walk, you know, you walk through these malls and you know, any of the strip malls, and they're all empty. And family businesses that have been there for 50 years. Since I was a kid, my, the first vitamins I ever bought, uh, you know, the, uh, Lonnie and his wife, they own the vitamin station. I mean, it's, it's gone. And uh, that's, it's kind of a symbol of Simi Valley, like you knew the dad or the person that was at the glass store or, the, or you went and saw, you know, you went to Tony's Tires, you know? So yeah, I mean, I'd like to see a little more subsidization and, and, uh, and help from the city with, with these businesses. Thank you. Joe, same question to you, attracting new businesses and the town center. 
I am in favor of attracting business to Simi Valley. Um, to Brandon's point earlier, I, I am not a big box business attractor. I would want to bring middle class jobs to Simi Valley. Those are the things that we that we need to look at. I had some ideas. Uh, you know, there's a lot of film production done in Simi Valley. Somebody who works in the entertainment industry, um, uh, you know, would, would have a, I want to say an insider's perspective. That's not really true. I just know about that stuff. But the reality of it is, there. I mean, we don't promote our local businesses to those folks that are coming in from outside. They're coming in here and doing productions. They should be able to know where all the food places are at, where who can do work local that can help them out. These are what these are things that our city could do, and to make revenue without even bringing a business to exist in the city. They would just be coming in and out. But I actually would look to bring in more uh, a permanence to uh, some to businesses that would attract middle class. Uh, um, a bit of wages. As far as the town center goes, I had some ideas on that as well. I think the, at its current in its current form, that town center is pretty much dead. We've got a we've got a we've got an AMC movie theater. We've got a Macy's, and that's some little small places. It's pretty much the Gotta Dance Academy Mall of Simi Valley. My daughters go to school there, by the way, so I, I love that, that that exists. But we can do something with that mall to make it more modern and to make it a place where people can gather and want to be. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I've got some good ideas for that. Thank you. Keith, we'll ask you for your thoughts about attracting businesses to Simi Valley, and also your thoughts about revitalizing the town center. Thank you. First of all, the uh, movie production in the city is going outstandingly well, and the uh, tourism uh, committee has produced a book that we hand to people when they get a uh, permit to film that lists not only restaurants, but all services, uh, uh, rental places, table and chairs where you can rent them. The list goes on and on and on. We reach out extremely well to the uh, film industry and that's evidenced by the number of permits and how quickly you can get a permit. So I'd like to say that we're in great shape there with the exception of COVID has definitely hurt the number of permits recently. As far as Big's Box, if you have an existing uh, building, we can't deny if, if Walmart wants to come in and rent a place that's owned and already built, we as a city cannot deny them to go into that place. We'd be sued and that would be the end of uh, a lot of city revenue. So we can't choose who goes into these locations that are already built. Um, the thing that makes, brings up the vitality is the shoppers themselves. We have to get the message out to the Simi residents to shop local because they're the ones that make the, the local businesses successful. We can reduce the amount of government, I agree, and uh, ease up on any permitting to help businesses. And uh, the mall is a totally other subject. Thank we do not you, own the Keith. mall. Thank you, Keith. We'll have to stop you there. Okay, Robbie, no problem. Robbie, you're up next. Let's hear your thoughts about attracting businesses to Smee Valley and the mall. Well, I want to say I feel for Keith because a minute and 30 seconds is just vastly too short to start to tackle this topic. There are so many places to begin, one of which most people broach on small business in general. Uh, although Keith is correct, we can't preclude somebody for fear of litigation for moving into a particular building, we do have to establish on Erringer in Los Angeles, a new building that's currently a restaurant that serves pasta. And that, uh, that, that for a moment was going to be in competition with a small business that also uh, lived in that, a donut shop that lived in that uh, community. We need to make sure that we're not making mistakes of that nature. Fundamentally, let's take a look at our uh, business attraction plan. We have an economic development director. We had a fine economic development director who is now our city manager, as well as our director of emergency services. So we've got one guy running three tasks and economic development is so incredibly significant to this community that I think that is a challenge for the city as it is. That being said, most of our economic development initiative is driven by brokers and brokers don't necessarily have a particular investment in our community versus Porter Ranch a thousand oaks and it's difficult for us to com to compete with those communities because we're landlocked we have a just a relatively small population compared to both of those cities when you start segregating industrial from retail and the variety of different businesses in particular the mall uh, i believe that we can create strategic plans for each of those 
to drive economic development, singularly the most important component of our economy. Thank you very much. We're gonna move on to our next question. Robert, you're up first for this next question. Uh, there's a couple I'm gonna combine here. One is the, the city balance is unbalanced. The city budget is unbalanced, that we pretend the budget is balanced. The roads, even major roads, are in extremely poor condition. And recently there was the decision process over the pensions, trying to uh, knock down some of the pension liabilities. So tell us, Robert, if you're elected, what are your thoughts about dealing with the budget and pension obligations? Well, I would say transparency for number one. Um, we know exactly what we're talking about. I'm sure that this is probably a, a common problem because all forms of government never seem to be able to balance a budget. So I, I believe transparency is huge. Get this transparent, get it out there. There are citizens here that would probably be very, uh, you, know, well, you know, willing to take a look at that and give us their input. So I think we should get that out there to all the citizens right away, you know, and make it very transparent um, so that we can do something about it. And you said it was a two part question. Just your views about the pension obligations of the city. Well, they said they should honor them, I would think, if that's the right thing to do. Um, but again, transparency, you know, this is, this is a broad, uh, er, this is an area where we need transparency. And, and then I could probably answer a lot better on that. So. Okay, thank you. Brandon, you're up next. Your views about balancing the budget or the budget being out of balance and also your thoughts about some of the pension liabilities that the city has. As far as the pensions and liabilities goes, I wish I was educated more on the subject to have a better opinion on this matter. As far as balancing the budget, I believe Robert was onto something when he said we need transparency. Complete transparency, I think, would help us all to know what's going on. Um, we could also take a look at where everything's being allocated and start reallocating some of the funds from our most funded to those where we actually need them the most. I will see the rest of my time. Okay, thank you. Keith, same question to you. What is your position about the budget? Um, I'm sure you, we obviously have to have a balanced budget, but that it's not really a um, balanced budget, that the roads are not being taken care of. And what are your thoughts about dealing with the pension obligation? Okay, I'll try saying that real quick. First of all, I'm the guy that's been calling for transparency since the day I became a council member six years ago. I call for transparency at every corner. I agree with my counterparts here that call for transparency. The budget currently is in good shape. The city is actually financially okay. Where we're headed though, because of COVID, we have to look at the future. And part of that looking at the future has been looking at our pension obligation, and which is a huge amount of money. The state has given us a couple of uh, problems in that They've let the pension uh, obligation go out of control. And then they also took away our um, uh, redevelopment fundings that we use for roads and things like that. And so they've really taken a, a huge amount of our budget away. And at the same time, the cost of everything is going up and the need is going up. The pension obligation funds, um, the idea there, we were searching for a way to uh, ease up on our, the amount of money. And the, basically the way I would call it is if you had a credit card that was at 15% and you're currently holding one at 25%, you just would take that 15% or, and, and pay off the 25. So you still owed the money, but at a much different rate, which could have been very uh, beneficial to the city. However, there are some pitfalls with it. Gonna to have to stop you there, Keith. So, Robbie, we'll move on to you. Your views about the budget, is it a pretend budget, but not really balanced? Um, and what are your thoughts about the pension obligation? Well, first of all, let me give credit where credit is due. You know, seniors have one of the finest credit ratings in its history in terms of economic uh, 
uh, performance. One of the problems, though, is that this city has grown up on the backs of developers. These were farmlands, we're building housing, we'll never build out, and it's time for us to pivot. And I think this is an area of tremendous weakness for the city because we don't know where to generate that revenue. So again, most of these issues are inextricably interlinked. We don't have uh, a balanced, a structured balanced budget, uh, but for the $3 million property tax kickback and the savings on the prior budget, we would have been upside down already and it's headed in the wrong direction. Overarching this is the pandemic. None of us have had an opportunity, I'm sure we would all agree, in terms of saying the pandemic and the socioeconomic impact of that is yet to be determined. So what we're gonna to have to do to address that is on top of the budget woes that we already have. With regard to pensions, look, I've got a lot of union guys on the call, so I'm gonna duck when you shoot spitball at me. We are absolutely obligated for all the pensions that we have signed up to, but I'm convinced that we have to start looking for new hires at moving away from fixed annuities and moving to very highly matched defined contribution plans, not the norm two or 3%, I'm talking about 10, maybe 15% matching to try to get us out from under the long-term impact of the pension. I am grateful the pension obligation bonds didn't go through. I would never support it. It's a gamble with public money to try to offset the debt. Thank you. And Robbie, so you know, your Wi-Fi seems to cut in a little bit or not, maybe uh, overloaded within your home. So we're getting almost everything you say, but the picture is sometimes uh, pauses. Joe, we're going to move on to the same question, I should say. We're moving on to you. Same question. Share with us your views about budgeting and pension obligations. Well, I think three of the people on this call are either retired union people or current union people. Uh, and I am a 20-year union leader, so I would be, I'd have to shoot myself in the head if I said I want to give up the pensions. We need to be, we need to have, we have a, an obligation to those people who worked their entire lives in the city and built those pensions up and worked for their retirement. These people aren't on 401ks, they're not on social security in many cases because they're, 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 they work in the public sector, so they can't, they, they can't get that, it's like teachers. So we need to be, we need to, we need, we're obligated to pay those things. What do you do? How do you fix it? Revenue, you've gotta bring in money to the city. What is the offset? If you're not able to bring in revenue to the city, that you might as well forget about the pensions. I mean, there's no, there's no money coming in at this point, right? We've gotta have, more or increased revenues. We've got to look, look at our malls, look at the places that are, that are closed down, look at all the board of places in the city. You see the lack of revenue in this in Simi Valley. These places don't exist anymore and they used to exist. A lot of these places were here 10 years ago. Our mall did not look like it looks like now 10 years ago. These are mismanagement of the mall, the way the property owners and the developers have, have, have mismanaged this mall, the way that they use this mall I think as a tax shelter I mean, these are things we need to address as a city, and we need to we need to reform that. So I am in favor of pensions, and I am in favor of the pension obligation, and I am in favor of increasing revenue in the city to address that issue. Thank you. Joe, we're going to stay with you for the next question. We're going to shift gears a little bit. We'll start talking about the environment. So I'm going to combine two issues. We have global climate change. What are your thoughts about climate change, and what do you think the city can do and also your thoughts on the Santa Susana Field Lab and what should be done there. Well, I believe climate change is real, just to get that out of the way. Uh, the other part of that is uh, what we do in the city. How do we address the issues going forward? I know the uh, state has a mandate uh, to cut gas-powered vehicles or, or not to have, or not to buy any more gas-powered, or not to sell any more gas-powered vehicles after 2035. Honestly, we need to look for now what can we do now to start do, looking at, uh, out for the environment? Uh, as a city, we're a commuter city. One of the reasons I was talking about bringing businesses into town is because it would, it would lessen the impact of our commuter traffic. The less money you spend on gas, the less driving you do, the less the impact there is to the environment. Those are good things for the city. Also, and the offset of that is you're bringing in jobs to the city. So it's kind of a win-win. And uh, I forgot the second part of that question. You said something about Santa the whole Susanna Field Lab. Oh, well, the Santa Susana Field Lab is a, it's a major problem. I, I have done a lot of research on that in the, even before I moved to Simi Valley. So I had concerns, and I still do. I think we do need a clean up over there. I know there is something going on with the Chumash Indian tribe. Uh, I, I, there's some kind of a, with, and Boeing, where they're trying to sell it to them. I, I, I'm very concerned about that, the opening up of businesses up there, or possibly opening up houses without housing, without any kind of environmental cleanup is, is gonna be detrimental to everyone who lives there or, or works there. 
So uh, I think we need to do something with that and we need to address that. The mayor can say something to the, to the, to the state reps. The mayor can say something to everybody. They just, they just have to open their mouth. Thank you. Keith, same question to you. What is your position about global climate change? Are there things we could do locally? And what do you think can be done to resolve the Santa Susana Field Lab? Well, I, I think the answer is there's things we are doing locally. The city of Simi Valley for the last uh, approximately three years has been very active in converting over to solar power in all of their uh, buildings within the city. You can see that at the police uh, station, you can see it here at uh, the senior center. And it, it, it was an initial outlay of a lot of uh, cost. However, the returns are coming back already. It, it's, it's coming back clearly in savings to the city. So it was a very good investment and it was very good for our environment. When you speak of the uh, Santa Susana Field Lab, um, I've been up there several times. I've met with uh, uh, Mr. Perry from Texas when he was the, uh, what was his title? Uh, anyway, um, of Energy. and we've always as a city have urged and pushed for a full cleanup. Uh, that is not our jurisdiction. So we can't tell them they have to do it. We don't have jurisdiction over that area. And so we go and they invite us up and we give our two cents and we encourage them to take uh, action. I'd also like to put a, a point out that in uh, August, um, w we approved and started putting up electric uh, vehicle charging stations. So you're gonna see them coming up more and more throughout the city. So this city is doing a very good job of uh, protecting the environment via- Thank you, Keith. Have to stop you there. Yeah. Brandon, you're up next. Let's hear your thoughts about global climate change. Is there something the city should be doing and what do you think should be done about Santa Susana Field Lab? So I do believe global climate change is a thing and it's impacting us all. Um, I would like to echo what Joe said. I probably couldn't have said it better myself. I also appreciate seeing these uh, electric charging stations around town it really makes me feel like Simi does care and we're trying to do something about it. Um, I would also like to see our public transit be a little more prominent. I know I didn't know much about a public transit uh, scenario until I started working for the school district and had to start teaching our students how to use the public transit system. So I feel like there's a lot of uh, learning to be done about that to be in the know about it. So if we made that a little more prominent, I feel like we cut down some of our emissions and whatnot. As far as the Santa Susana Field Lab, I've done a little bit of research on it, but not nearly enough to have an intelligent response to that. So I need to do more research about that, but I do know that we need to clean it up and I would like to see it the rest of my time. Okay, thank you. Robert, we'll move on to you to wrap up this question. What is your position on global climate change? Do you think there's things the city should be doing? And what do you think should be done to solve the Santa Susana Field Lab? Well, I think the Santa Susana Field Lab is, is Hugely important. I mean, I, I believe, again, uh, we need a lot of transparency on that issue and people uh, of this city need to be informed. Uh, you know, I'm a cancer survivor. I uh, had no history of cancer in my family and, and uh, it was an airway cancer. You know, I never smoked in my life. I was an athlete here and, uh, and in college and, uh, and I got an airway cancer. So like I said, I lived here 53 years. We played in those hills. I don't know, you know, my, at that point you just want to get cured. So um, yes, I, I think there could be still, there still could be some dangers there. We need to, uh, to bring experts in, you know, and, and continue to not let that get away. As far as global warming, Simi Valley, I used to believe for the longest times, I, this is a wives tale or folk, you know, uh, urban legend. Simi Valley means Valley of the Wind. It doesn't, <laughs> but it's windy here, you know? So I'd like to see a little more use of some wind power, uh, see what the community thinks of it. That would be, uh, you know, something that I'd like to bring to the community and, and they can tell me what they think of that. And then, you know, it's what they say goes, you know, and, and we come back, but yeah, global warming needs to be addressed. We need to move forward in that area. Thank you. Keith, we're gonna to move to you for the next question. 
Uh, this has come up in almost every forum I've done around the county so far. But the issue of looking at racial inequality, social injustice, Black Lives Matter, these are issues that have been uh, talked about throughout the nation. And here in Simi Valley, they've uh, prompted some important conversations and some controversies and even divisiveness. So if you were elected, what are some of your philosophical views about these issues? And what do you think is a way to bring people together? Thank you. Um, first of all, my, my personal view is there's no room for racism anywhere. Unfortunately, unfortunately, every city uh, in this country has uh, racism and inequalities of some sort. And it's horrible that we do and that we continue to fight this fight. I am currently working with a group. Uh, we met last night, as a matter of fact. And what we're working on is a very comprehensive line of communications. And uh, that's being able to, to be with people uh, that are white and people of color and not be afraid to share ideas and ask questions of each other. You know, does this bother you? And not being afraid to tell somebody, hey, what you just said, it offends me, but this is why. An explanation, instead of being angry, uh, an explanation or an education. And we're making great headway at this time. The uh, police chief has just announced that he's going to have open forums, kind of like town halls, where everybody's invited. And the whole idea is to hear what folks are saying about uh, reform measures that they would like to see in the police department. And what this does is gives him an opportunity to also show what has already taken place because many of the demands that have been made have already been addressed years ago and the folks just don't realize it. So it's a okay, great I'll opportunity. Stop you there, Keith. Thank you. Okay, uh, Robbie, you're up next. Let's hear your, your views about racial injustice, social inequality, Black Lives Matter. What are some of the things that you think should be happening in Simi Valley? Well, I think fundamentally, it's important for everyone to make clear uh, where their position is. I would tend to doubt that anybody would uh, digress much from the position that no human being anywhere should be targeted, discriminated against, uh, uh, suffer any prejudice for their race, their culture, their creed, their ability, handicapped or otherwise, uh, economic status, or any of the other many distinctions that we make between groups. My sense is, and I think you've touched on it briefly, uh, peripherally, uh, the truth is that our, our, our species tends to make these distinctions by nature. You like the Rams, I like the Chargers, you drink Bud Light, I drink Miller Light. To whatever degree, we're constantly differentiating and distinguishing between different characteristics. If you go to a football game, people fight over the color shirt you're wearing. Uh, and so we tend to respond to these things emotionally. And this fundamentally is a very emotionally tender issue. I think it's important that we identify that this type of distinctiveness, this potential for bias or prejudice, whether intended or otherwise, is simply a function of the human condition. It exists. We need to elevate our consciousness of it, and we need to be able to speak freely to one another. Shift a position if. If I could tell you I promise to sign legislation that will eliminate racism, I would. I can't. In order to go there, you have to lead as a leader and thank, thank demonstrate you, what you, you want the to community to behave. Joe, same question to you. Share with us your perspective on these uh, important issues, Black Lives Matter, racial inequality, what the city should be doing. I'm, um, I've actually been at all of the, uh, at the Black Lives Matter uh, rallies myself. I mean, as they asked, actually, I've been asked to go quite often because I, from what I do, I, you know, for safety patrol and those kind of things. And I believe in the cause. I think that there is a, um, there is systemic racism that exists in every city in this country. Simi Valley is no exception. I think our leadership doesn't speak out enough against it. If I was a mayor, I would definitely address that at the city council issue. I would say we do not condone racism in Simi Valley. This is not a city for racists. My neighbor across the street who has his half Confederate, half American flag out there, who's got the Trump 2020 sign, he's okay. He's a nice guy, doesn't say a whole lot, but you know, we don't talk at all. 
<laughs> and so uh, that's a problem. And we have, this is not a one color city. I am not one color. I'm multicultural, as many of my neighbors are. This is not the same city it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We need to address those issues. We need to denounce racism in Simi Valley. We need to recognize that black lives indeed do matter and, and not accept the status quo. Thank you. I'll see the rest Thank of you. Thank you. We'll move on to Robert. So share with us your views on these issues. Well, so Simi Valley. Simi Valley is like other cities. I agree. Racism exists here. The way Simi Valley is put together is the most extraordinary people anywhere. And what, what I'd like to see happen, see, what people don't know about Simi Valley people is they don't run from a fight. I think here in Simi Valley is where the other cities are going to look to how we solve this problem here. This is all the model for all the other cities in this country is going to come from Simi Valley. I truly believe that. Because here in Simi Valley, you're like, you're talking about sons and daughters, not talking to their parents. Or you're talk, talking about your grandkids. This is, this is, this is a very, a very extraordinary group of people here that will run to, to solve this issue. So I'm absolutely, you know, for people in this community stepping up and fighting if they have to, you know, civilly until they're friends at the end. Thank you. That's what we used to do. Thank you. Brandon, we'll wrap up this question with you. Share with us your thoughts about these issues and what you think the city should be doing to promote um, a sense of fairness with every resident. So I'd like to echo what most everyone has said. Um, I have been attending protests since May as well. Um, I grew up in this town, went to middle school, elementary school, high school, and I had friends physically assaulted for the color of the skin by people with swastika tattoos shouting racial slurs of the sin. So I have physically seen that myself. I'm not saying that Simi is in itself is inherently racist because it is not. Seem is a pretty good place to live in, but we can't pretend that things like this don't happen. Whether it happens to a million people or happens to 30 people, it still happens. Saying that we denounce it is the first thing we should do, but we should also take steps to keep that from happening. We need to start educating more. Um, uh, an organization called 805 Resistance out in Canal Valley, I believe just came with a, to an understanding with the school district to start a more inclusive and diverse school curriculum to talk about more people of color and things of the sort. And I think that would be a great thing to implement around here as well to get us talking about more diversity. Um, there was a second part to this question, correct? If you think there's certain things the city should be doing, but you've covered it if you wish. I did. Um, I will see the rest of my time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Brandon, we're gonna start with you though for the next question. We haven't talked about seniors at all. If you were elected, would you have any particular policies that you would promote to help seniors within the community? So recently I've started looking more into the senior center. I think that's an awesome thing. We, CME takes pride in, in our seniors and I think that's awesome. There's a lot of senior people living here and I love to see those signs on the bus or on, on the street saying, the rendezvous cafe and things like that uh, promoting the seniors to come and hang out i would love to see some of those programs to be continued i would love to see more community outreach of people getting together and going and visiting the seniors who maybe don't have family or don't have those social circles to take care of them i would love to see the community get involved in in taking care of uh, the the latter generation, the people that essentially build all these things for us, the people that we all love things to. We, we need to keep reaching out to them, make sure they're all healthy. And I would love to see the community and the city put forward more programs of the sort. I know we have a few 
in place and those are great. And I think we need to continue on that. I would see the rest of my time. Thank you. Joe, same question to you. What type of policies would you promote and advocate for regarding seniors? Uh, as a person who's getting to that age myself, uh, I would definitely promote <laughs> as many policies as I could to help our seniors. Our seniors, I have many friends of my, uh, many of my friends are uh, elderly, older, older people. And we have spoken about those, uh, these specific issues many times. I know we have a cooling center in town. Uh, the, the last couple of weeks, I know you guys, are, I'm sure everybody realizes it's been very hot. Mm -hmm. Our cooling center, I think has been open quite a bit during those times, but I don't think it's open long enough. I think we need to have more programs for our seniors and, and seniors. I know we're doing something with housing. I know there are, there are housing projects that are being built for, for senior, for senior uh, living, but um, we should also remember that they were, you know, I, I have my mother and father and my grandmother and my grandmother were very, very, I'm very close to me. I mean, Latino families are, we tend to revere our elders. And um, I don't want to see any of our seniors left out in the cold and not being able to seek services that they that they need. Uh, neighbor to neighbor program would be a good idea to try and get, make sure the, those folks are being serviced and are being spoken to because they're not being left out on their own. Um, it's a terrible thing when you see a, a person of, of age uh, living alone and nobody's helping them, nobody's talking to them. The community needs to do some outreach with them. We can do some programs. I spoke about community, community service programs earlier. Those are, the, those are some of the ones that I would seek to, to implement in the city of Sydney Valley. Thank you, Robbie. Sorry to cut you off. Robbie, same question on seniors. No problem, and I'll pick up actually right where, where Jill left off in terms of community services. So in my history as a nonprofit director, uh, we consciously uh, look to how we can support the senior population now. Your question is relatively open, so we have to bear in mind that there are a lot of issues impacting senior housing affordability, impact senior citizens, uh, quality of care, uh, and, and what they share with many other uh, marginalized or disadvantaged populations, whether they're handicapped, developmentally disabled, uh, even juvenile justice or, or other marginalized populations, is that a sense of isolation becomes quite pervasive for that community. And integrating seniors into a, a daily living community. It's a way of enriching their lives in addition to supporting their needs from a housing standpoint and certainly from transportation standpoint. There will be some consideration with the budget woes we have moving forward as to whether or not we can afford to continue to service with dial-a-ride or other transportation options that seniors have become uh, dependent on today. And they've, they've been very vocal about their desire to keep dial-a-ride and not start to outsource that service to another provider. So I think a comprehensive approach and to seniors, it would be essentially driven from uh, the uh, Council on Aging, uh, which can spearhead for us what particular needs we need in, as Joe mentioned, the community service sense, with the eye towards integrating these communities, much in the way that uh, Community Garden does, for example, integrating these communities into a more meaningful future and making sure we provide for their needs. Thank you, Robert. Same question to you on policies you would advocate for regarding seniors. Okay, uh, I'd like to. I definitely would like to, to um, concur with Robbie right there about consulting with the Council on Aging. Uh, this is something that we need to do. We need, you, you know, in, in my position, if elected, again, I need to hear from the senior citizens on what they would like to see. It's, it's really, I'm serving them. So we, there definitely needs to be a meeting there our senior citizen, after being orientated by the city manager and uh, having a, a, a long discussion, we have one of the finest senior citizens uh, out there, uh, senior, senior centers out there. And, and uh, I'd like to expand on that. It was really fantastic, you know, to hear that we're, we're kind of setting the bar. And that, that's what I'd like to see more of Simi Valley. Hope you're going to come back here, Robert. I have lost to Robert. Robert, we'll um, just mute you and we're going to move on to Keith. Let's hear your thoughts, uh, Keith, about solutions or policies you would advocate for uh, for seniors. Wow. <laughs> Sometimes uh, it, it, it pays to uh, stand back and take a look. I'd like to say that the Council on Aging, we get reports on a regular basis to the City Council and there are council members assigned to 
the Council on Aging uh, Board. So there's this direct link with the council. Uh, we have one of the finest uh, senior centers, I would, I would think probably in the United States. And one of the things that happens at our senior center, it is so good that we often uh, get uh, participants from the other valley coming over because they want to be at this senior center. And I'm of the age where I could go in there and I have to tell you that there's people a lot older than me and the workouts, it's an incredible sports facility on top of all the other uh, services they offer such as food and what have you. Um, uh, someone spoke of the, uh, the cooling uh, center because of the heat we had. Now, I don't know why, but that there was uh, some comments made and there's a standard on when we do open that cooling center. It was open and uh, the senior center was, which takes a lot of staffing to do. And there was two people one day and I think five the second day. So I don't know where they're staying. I'm glad we were able to provide that, but uh, I hope no one was getting hot being left out of the cooling center. Thank you. Uh, candidates, we have time for one more question if I limit you to one minute. So we're going to change the clock to one minute and try and give you a question. I'm really going to ask you for some specifics if you can. You're, you're talking to your voters. There are voters out there who are still undecided. So what is your message to them and can you give specific examples of how you will work well with your colleagues to improve the city? Perhaps you want to talk about past issues or maybe some other examples. But Ravi, in about a minute, tell us what makes you special and what makes you have some great plans to work with your colleagues. Well, thank you, David, and I appreciate that you would start with me. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think Keith would even attest to the fact that I am a regular policy advocate and engage with city council at essentially every meeting. I know all of our council members. I know the mayor as well. I don't see through a political lens. Um, for undecided voters, I think it's important to to recognize that the future that we're moving into has a, a series of really difficult challenges. We do have an unstructured, unbalanced budget. We no longer can rely on development to simply keep us afloat. We're coming out of an unprecedented socioeconomic crisis that we don't even know the cost of yet. And the community is completely factionalized. The strength of Simi Valley, the infrastructure that matters in Simi Valley are the people. The people make the community. We have to begin by pulling our community back together. If we can start to unify as a community, our leadership will be able to be efficacious moving forward. That's the kind of Simi Valley I would lead. Thank you. Brandon, I know it's only a minute, but if you can give us your thoughts about what you specifically would tell your voters and potential voters that you will do to work with your colleagues and improve the city. So I would like to listen to everyone who has anything to say. I would love to have just open ears and listen to all the possibilities that of things we can do in the city. I would be as transparent as I possibly could be with all of my doings. Uh, even if it meant working with people I don't see eye to eye with, I'm sure we can come up with some sort of middle ground. Um, as far as potential voters, no matter who you vote for this election, make sure you just get involved. Like. Robbie was saying, like, we are all part of this community. We are what makes Simi Valley. So we need to get involved. Direct action. You know, if you know that your neighbor is going through hard times, check in on your neighbor. Uh, you know, someone down the street is missing out on food, bring them over some food. You know, just get involved. Direct action. We're all part of this community, and we can all make us thrive. I'll see you in my time. Thank you. Robert, same question to you. What specific examples can you give our uh, viewers as far as how you'll work with your colleagues to improve the city? Well, I, I'd like to say I, I love working with colleagues. That's all I do. Uh, most of the time, the work I do now, the infrastructure's there, everything's great. It's just a matter of getting people to work together. Uh, Simi Valley's no different. I don't think Armageddon's coming for this city's budget or Simi Valley's, you know, going to collapse, but I do believe the people of Simi Valley are hurting and you see it everywhere. There's a big gap, especially growing through the generations. And uh, this is something that we need to heal. And so 
saying that, I'd say I'd really like to work with, with my colleagues and anybody who wants to, to heal this city. Everything else follows that. First, let's heal the people of this city and then everything else will fall in place. Thank you. And Keith, we'll go to you. So what specific examples can you give about how you'll work with all of your colleagues to improve the city? I, I attempt to, at this time, work with all the colleagues. Uh, I think that's very important. I think we need a cohesive council. I think we need to discuss things and be able to disagree with each other, but not be disagreeable in doing so. And always look at the end result. The end result is to benefit the people of this city. I'm a, a mayor that listens. Uh, my business card is my uh, cell phone number. I answer that and I will talk to anybody that calls. Uh, I think that's an important factor. I think it's also important to have experience. I, I admire the gentlemen that are, are running for mayor. At the same time, I think that a better route is to have some time as a council member, maybe a, a, a planning commission member, having been through the process so you understand the city that you're going to become the figurehead leader of. And I think that's a, an asset that I have that I can offer to the community. Thank you. And Joe, we'll wrap up this question with you. We'll give you a moment to unmute Joe and then we'll get started. Yeah, I got my computer froze for a minute. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, you wanted specifics about what I would bring to the city or who I am. Yes, and working with your colleagues to improve the city. Right, I'm a 20 year union leader. In that position, a, a union is a microcosm of a community. My executive board is a microcosm of the city council. My president is a representative like a mayor would be. We have, I had to learn and I've learned through my experience to work with people of different, or different beliefs, different political leanings, different creeds, different colors. These are not things that are difficult to do if you have interest in doing them. The uh, administering of the city, like any other, any other business entity, is uh, fairly, I don't wanna say milk toast, but they're fairly boilerplate. You do one thing, you do them all. I know this city. I wanted to echo the last thing I wanted to say was th echoing on Robbie's, my tagline is strength, unity, and hope. I want to unify this city. That's my goal for being mayor. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And candidates, we've reached about the halfway point for tonight. Uh, don't worry, I'm joking. We're ready actually for closing statements. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and begin with closing statements in the reverse order. Keith, you were, uh, you'll be the first for our closing statements. When you're ready, you'll have a minute and a half. Okay, thank you. Um, I have the experience. I've been here. I served this community all uh, since 1975 when I became a uh, firefighter with Ventura County, served here in Simi Valley, and left uh, the fire department at the rank of uh, battalion chief. And at that time, I didn't retire. I reached out and became an aide for a supervisor, still serving the community. I've uh, been on the Boys and Girls um, Board years ago. I've stayed involved. I am involved in nonprofits. I have uh, raised two daughters here that went through Simi Valley Schools, and now I have two grandsons that I'm very proud of that are going through Simi Valley Schools. I am here to stay, I am here to serve, and I'm available to you, and I listen to you. Not just one segment, I listen to the entire community. And I want to continue that service and provide the community with the, the tagline that we keep saying, Simi Valley is great. And I believe that it can be, and we have some hiccups going on. I wanna work on those hiccups and smooth things out and have Mainly the biggest hiccup is we need a cohesive council. And uh, hopefully after this election, we're going to have a cohesive council and that will better serve this community. Thank you. Our next candidate is Robbie Hidalgo. One and a half minutes, Robbie. Thank you very much. Did I unmute successfully? You're fine. Great, thank you. So I, I'll actually pick up on uh, somewhere that, that Keith left off, this wasn't typically part of my closing, but I wouldn't look to the next election to be the solution for a cohesive council. 
we're going to have whatever council the voters determine we have. It could be any one of us, it could be a write-in candidate. And whatever those cards may be, however they may fall, the role of a good leader is to find common ground, irrespective of who may populate any seat. And that is a differentiation in my candidacy. I am not running from a politically polarized position. I'm running because I love this community. This is a nonpartisan role, and we are at a turning point in this city's history. If you take a look at last year's forum, every topic we have touched on today, with the exception of the recent social issues, such as BLM and racism, which have come to the fore, every single topic we have talked about today, we were talking about two years ago. And what that tells me is that we haven't made meaningful progress on those issues. We don't have an indefinite number of terms to go. I won't deny uh, the, the incumbent, of course, has great experience. We have other candidates here who all have a heart for Simi Valley. The decision to be made is how can we stop talking about this two years from now when we all gather again in this forum and can show that we've made some demonstrable progress. That's what I pledge. That's what I commit to. That's what I believe I can bring to this role. Thank you. Our next candidate for closing statement is Joe Ayala. I'm unmuted. Here we go. Next time you say a joke, David, you got to smile because I it's just did not. It's without an audience. That's all I can tell you. It's hard without an audience. It's all right. I was laughing over here. We'll reset the timer, Joe. And Thank uh, you so much. I'm not trying to use up or, or, or eat my time. Um, I, uh, I think I beat a dead horse on this, but whenever you're ready, I'll go ahead and start. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for your time. My name is Joe Ayala. I don't want to focus on this, but I am a 20 year who, who has been in the fight working for fighting for union people for a long time. I think uh, working with a diverse group of people that I do work with currently and having lived in the city as long as I've lived here gives me the uh, intelligence, the wisdom, and the, the knowledge to be able to move the city forward. I, I am able to work with anybody. I've worked with people who I were completely in line politically and people who we completely disagree politically. So my best friends and I have the funniest disagreements and yet at the end of the day, we all realize we're all working to this, towards a common goal. When you're, when you're negotiating a contract, when you're out on the street and representing your memberships, it doesn't matter if they're Republicans, it doesn't matter if they're independents, it doesn't matter if they're Democrats. They're all people who are earning money. They're all people who are, they're members of a local, they're members of a union, they're working towards their betterment. So when, we, when I speak about representing everyone, I really mean what I say. I've been doing this for a long time and I think I would do a good job as the mayor of Simi Valley. My, um, one of the things I want to just close on is if we want to make this city better, we need to be inclusive. If we can't recognize that there are people of diverse backgrounds in the city, if we don't recognize that people in our city council are not all one color anymore, then we're not going to move forward. We've got to recognize that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Robert Clarice Well, I'm a, I'm resident of Simi Valley 53 years. I'm a father, I have four kids. Three of them are attending school here, all, all, different, all different ages. My oldest is a straight A student. I'll just throw that in, double major at the University of California, Merced. I would argue that I'm exactly what this city needs. They need a worker. Union, Joe can testify. I'm union trade workers, some of the best workers, trained, went through the trade schools, work hard. My father has lived here. He came here from America, from Italy to America. He came here and worked. He's 80 years old. He's built, if you look over to the north, you'll see the house that he's building with a shovel and a hammer still at 80 years old. So I'm a workhorse. I like being the worker. I like this, this position calls for that. It doesn't call for a chief. It doesn't call for the, the head, a supervisor. It calls for somebody with experience and being a worker for these people of Simi Valley. And that's what I'll be because I am one. Thank you. Thank you. And Brandon, we'll let you wrap up all the closing statements for us tonight. So when you're ready, a minute and a half, Brandon. All right. I don't have a resume nearly as impressive as everyone else on this call. Um, 
I'm still in my 20s. I'm a community activist. I'm a paraeducator. And I'm severely underqualified. And I know that. But I care enough about this community to get involved. I've always loved this community. And I know we could always do better. So I thought I'd throw my hat in here and at the very least and get people involved. Um, doesn't matter if you vote for me, vote for someone else, or don't vote at all. We're also part of this community. We also need to get involved. Um, don't just wait for someone else to do it. Don't just put it on the city council. Don't put it on the mayor to put it on the police force. We need to get involved with the things that we care about. We need to take care of each other. And those are my closing remarks. I see the rest of my time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all the candidates for your hard work running. We know that's a very difficult job. Before we end, we have a special presentation from the league. We'll share this quickly. So at the league, we'd like to remind you that to plan your vote. So we have a big election coming up in November. You have many options. Every registered voter will get a mail-in ballot. You can return that through the postal service, ballot boxes, or you can return it to one of the voting centers. And if you want to vote in person, you can go to any voting center in Ventura County. Some important dates to be aware of. Around October 2nd, ballots will start being mailed out to all voters, and the drop boxes will open on October 6th, so you can return them when you're ready. If you do not receive a ballot by October 16th, contact the Elections Department to make sure that they can get you another ballot. And you can register up through the 19th. Very important, the league recommends that all voters try to return mail-in ballots by October 20th. That'll guarantee that they get into the postal service and get to the county in time. Now, a ballot to be counted, a mail-in ballot to be counted must be signed. So please make sure you remember to sign your ballot. And when those ballots are returned, as long as it's postmarked by November 3rd, the county has up to two weeks to count them. So please understand, we may not have results right away, nationally, statewide. It may take us a while to get results as all the ballots are counted. And finally, I'd like to point you to several different resources. Where'smyballot.sos.ca.gov. It's a great way for tracking your ballot. Every mail-in ballot has a unique ID. And with this, you can know if it's been mailed, if, you, if they think you've received it, if you've returned it, has it been delivered to the County Elections Department? For learning more about elections, you should visit votersedge.org slash CA. A great amount of information there on candidates and ballot propositions. Type in your address and it'll show you all of the people that are running within your area. And for many of them, they will have profiles telling you more about their plans. The League of Women Voters reminds you to vote. We also wanna let you know that tonight's program has been recorded. It'll be up on our website within 48 hours. And you can go to that same website where you register. Just go to lwvventuracounty.org, click on the candidate forums. You can see tonight's forums. You can register for other forums. We're barely a third of the way through, probably less than that. So many forums to come, including congressional, hopefully a congressional forum for this 25th district for Simi Valley. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the candidates tonight. I'd like to thank our viewers and we remind you to vote. And with that, good night to all. Thank you. Thank you.